Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Rebecca Baxt podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Baxt, board-certified dermatologist, and I'm here to discuss with you all issues relating to the skin that you're in. In this podcast, we will tackle the topic of the day quickly to get you the take-home points that you need. After listening to an episode, you should be educated about the topic and able to fix the issue yourself or well-prepared to ask the right questions at your next dermatology appointment. Let's get started. Today, I would like to discuss skin biopsies, what that means, the different types, what to expect from a skin biopsy when it happens, and when it's healing. So first, skin biopsies. What is a biopsy? A biopsy is when the dermatologist takes a small piece of the skin and sends it to the lab to find out what it is. We do this for many reasons. If there's something we're worried is a skin cancer or there's a rash and we're not sure what it is, biopsies are very useful for dermatologists and patients to do and have if we aren't sure what the thing on the skin is. It helps us determine because we can send it to the lab and the pathologist gives us a reading on it. So once we've determined that we need to do a biopsy or we want to do a biopsy, there are two main types of skin biopsies, shave biopsies and punch biopsies. Most of what I do in my office are shave biopsies, but I will discuss both of the types. First, shave biopsies. The preparation for both biopsies are the same. We clean the skin, I clean it with alcohol, then I numb the area of skin with a lidocaine injection. This hurts for a few seconds, feels like a bit of a bee sting. For kids or people who are very sensitive, it is possible to use a topical numbing cream first, topical lidocaine, and potentially even a cold spray before the injection to make it less uncomfortable. But it's really rare that we have to do that because the biopsies are really, the the discomfort is pretty minimal. Once the skin is numb, I use a disposable sterile blade to remove a tiny piece of skin. And it's usually pretty superficial. I just shave off a little piece. I describe it to patients as slightly deeper, but very similar to if they cut themselves shaving. I guess that's why it's called a shave biopsy. Sometimes the lesion that we are removing is sticking up off the surface of the skin, and we can also use a special sterile scissor called a gradle scissor to take it off instead of a blade. Some dermatologists like to use a big wide blade. I use a little blade, but whatever the method, the skin is cut. Then the patient bleeds. So I will use three methods in my office to stop bleeding. The first is aluminum chloride, which is a clear solution, and I usually apply some with a Q-tip. The second method is pressure, which I will often hold some pressure with the Q-tip or have the patient or my assistant hold pressure with a clean gauze. The third is cautery, and I often cauterize depending on the location and if the patient is on blood thinners and other factors. In my office, we have both an electric cautery that is very commonly used They're usually hanging on the wall in a dermatology office. They have disposable tips. But I also stock a handheld heat and battery-generated cautery in case the patient has a pacemaker nearby and we cannot use the electric cautery that's hanging on the wall. Between aluminum chloride pressure and cautery, we always get the bleeding to stop. Just a little aside on the lidocaine injection, in my office, I use plain lidocaine without epinephrine for biopsies. For decades, we used to use lidocaine with epinephrine, which is really the most common, but a few years ago, there was a nationwide shortage of that, and we literally couldn't get any, so we had to switch to plain lidocaine, and I really didn't find that it increased any bleeding complications. So even though there is no longer a shortage, we still don't use epinephrine. This has been a good switch in my opinion because epinephrine can sometimes make people feel ill as their hearts race, they get palpitations from it. The other issue with lidocaine is that sometimes there are people who are allergic to the preservatives in the lidocaine. So I do have preservative-free lidocaine for them. Then there are another subset of people who are actually allergic to the lidocaine and need something different to numb with. For that, I would have to order it for them, but I can do that. We would order something like Marcaine or Carbocaine. They usually come in knowing what they need. These allergies are rare, but they do happen. 
So now we are at the point of having completed the biopsy and stopped any bleeding, and now we have to put a bandage on the area. This could be a pressure bandage with gauze and a big bandage that is large, or a tiny steri strip or a small Band-Aid. I always recommend that patients try to leave the Band-Aid on at least until they get home and for up to one day maximum. The easiest time to remove a Band-Aid is in the shower when it gets a bit wet, but it can be removed earlier if it bothers the patient. Once the Band-Aid is removed, I recommend that the patient wash the area with soap and water in the shower and just leave it open. If the wound is in an area that is uncomfortable to leave open, such as the bra line or the underwear line or the belt line, then I recommend a clean Band-Aid daily and trying to leave it open at night. I do not like biopsies covered 24-7 as I think it takes much longer to heal. I believe that they need air. So I give patients a choice. If they want to cover it, they can cover it for half of a 24-hour period. They can either cover it at night or cover it during the day if that's more comfortable for them, but then the other half, they need to leave it open. If they are using a Band-Aid, they can apply either Vaseline or Aquaphor or Bacitracin or another antibiotic ointment as long as they are not allergic to it. Underneath the Band-Aid, that is fine. I instruct my patients to call me with any questions or issues about healing, and people do not call that often because we are pretty good about giving instructions. We also email them out since we found giving out paper instructions, people would always lose the piece of paper. So now they have it in an email. And skin infections from biopsies are pretty rare, but that is the thing that we worry about. I do biopsies every single day in my office, and it's only really once or twice a year that someone gets an infection. Infections usually present with the following symptoms. The biopsy starts to get more red, and the redness is spreading around the wound, and they have increasing drainage from the wound, and it's pussy. Fever or chills are also signs of infection, but that is really not typical for skin biopsies. If the patient is concerned, I have them either come in as soon as possible or send me a photo, and we take it from there. I will say people often complain of itching, but itching is a normal sign of healing. However, it can also be a sign that the patient is allergic to something that they are applying, and redness can also be a sign that they're allergic to something that they're applying in addition to being a sign of infection. So, If there's any questions or issues, I just have the patient reach directly out to me so we can figure them out. There are some areas of the body that are impossible to bandage, such as the scalp or the groin, and for these patients, they leave without a Band-Aid, but I often give them gauze in case they are feeling any bleeding, they can hold pressure. That's the other complication is bleeding. If a patient bleeds at home, I instruct them to hold pressure with a clean paper towel or tissue for 30 to 45 minutes without peaking, and the bleeding will usually stop. If it does not stop, I have them come back into the office and I will renumb them and recauterize and put on a large pressure bandage. Once in a blue moon, if someone ends up with really bad bleeding, They would need to go to an emergency room, but I cannot say that I remember that ever happening to any of my patients, but theoretically it is possible. Now let's talk about punch biopsies, because they are also very common. Some dermatologists do tons of punch biopsies. That is their preference. I prefer shave biopsies. There is no right or wrong answer here. Punch biopsies are all the same in terms of the cleaning and the numbing, but instead of shaving a piece of skin off, A small disposable sharp instrument is used to take a two, three, four, or six millimeter punch piece of skin, but it's a vertical cylinder instead of a broad shaved piece of skin. So it goes deeper than a shave biopsy typically. It can get all the way to the bottom of the layers of the skin if necessary, all the way down to the fat, and so you get a full thickness piece of skin. This is very useful, in my opinion, in the scalp when we're dealing with hair loss. There are many reasons why somebody might need a punch biopsy versus a shave biopsy. It is really the discretion of the person doing the biopsy. But once we do the punch biopsy, we usually need stitches to close it. Once in a while, a very small punch biopsy could be closed without a stitch, but typically sutures are needed. So now we just have to put in a few stitches to get it to close, and when we do that, the bleeding stops. So in the case of a punch biopsy, we typically do not need aluminum chloride or pressure or cautery. 
the stitches close the wound, and that creates pressure, and the bleeding stops. Typically, we take out the stitches in one to two weeks, depending on where the punch biopsy is on the patient. For example, on the face, we might take it out sooner, at a week or so. On the body, we would typically leave it in for 10 days to two weeks. And bandaging in my office is the same for a punch or a shave biopsy. And care at home, I tell people with a punch biopsy to try to wait a day before showering, but then clean with the same routine, soap and water, leave it open. If they have to cover it, they can cover it with a Band-Aid half of the time, just like with the shave biopsy. When there are stitches, I often will recommend using a little rubbing alcohol with a Q-tip to try to keep it clean. I would also say that there are many ways to take care of a biopsy site, and I'm describing here what my routine is as a board-certified dermatologist with a few decades and thousands of skin biopsies under my belt, but there are other ways done by other doctors that also work. This is what works well for me, but it is not the only way. There are many ways to do this. So now we are done discussing what a skin biopsy is, the two different types of skin biopsies, We discussed how it's performed, how we bandage it, what to do at home with a biopsy, warning signs of infection, and what to do if it's bleeding. So now I would like to discuss scarring. There is no planet in the universe where skin biopsies do not leave scars. There is always a scar. I'm not sure why some patients think that, oh, it won't leave a scar, will it, doctor? Yes, it always leaves a scar. We always leave a scar with a skin biopsy. Sometimes the scar is tiny and barely noticeable, and different patients heal differently, and different areas of the body heal differently. But if you have a skin biopsy, you have to expect a scar. There is no guarantee of no scar. There is usually a visible scar of some variety. So the question is really how to minimize scarring. And that starts with keeping the wound out of the sun. This seems obvious, but I will restate you need to keep it out of the sun. Sometimes that requires a Band-Aid on the beach or clothing or heavy-duty sunblock, but no sun on the biopsy site. Then if the scar starts to get bumpy, I ask the patients to come in and we assess to see whether it needs a little steroid injection to reduce the bump, which is easy to do. Sometimes this can take more than one injection, but we should be able to calm a little bump down. Then if the scar is red and bothersome, it can be lasered with a pulse dye laser such as the V-beam, and I do that fairly frequently if the redness is bothering the patient. The redness does go away over time, but the V-beam can help that go away more quickly. If at the end of the day we are unhappy with how the scar is healing, which by the way is pretty rare, I can also do Fraxel laser resurfacing And there's a whole podcast episode on Fraxel laser and also on treating scars if you want to listen to those. But I would say 99% of the time we have to do absolutely nothing with the scars from skin biopsies because they heal easily and really well and the scarring is minimal. But in the rare cases where the scar gets bumpy or it's discolored, there are things that we can do about it. So in summary, there are two main types of skin biopsies, shave biopsies and punch biopsies. Punch biopsies require stitches and shave biopsies do not. They are more like a superficial cut, like you cut yourself shaving. Biopsies generally heal really well and the risk of infection is very low. In my office, I like to have patients leave their wounds as open as possible. However, there are different ways of dealing with the healing and there is more than one right way to take care of a wound. If for some reason a patient is confused or concerned about healing or scarring, They need to call the office and we will take care of whatever the situation may be, whether it's bleeding or infection or scarring or whatever is concerning. These require a discussion with the office and myself. I hope that was helpful in understanding skin biopsies. And if you are listening and you are my patient and you are concerned about the healing of a skin biopsy, please call the office. If you are not my patient and you are concerned, please call whoever did your biopsy. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Dr. Rebecca Baxt podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Baxt, board-certified dermatologist. I hope this episode was informative and that you enjoyed listening. If you found this podcast useful, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others find us so we can help them too. Just a caveat to remember, this is not medical advice, and please see your dermatologist or doctor for questions pertaining to your specific situation. 
I look forward to talking with you again in the next episode.